Hey, welcome back. What we're going to read today is a section at the back of Scratching the Surface, which I call Living on Mars, A Few Details. And this section goes into several of the scientific concepts that come up in the story itself. Um, so let's get started. Gravity. Mars is much smaller than Earth. Its gravity is a little more than one third that of Earth. You would be able to jump higher and would return to the ground more slowly than you are used to. It would probably be great fun. Of course, if you were born there, this would seem perfectly normal to you. Moons. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Small and misshapen, they might not seem worth our attention. Still, since humans will one day look up at them and call them their own, maybe we should take a closer look at what that view will be like. We might find that they are more interesting than we expect. The Earth's moon. Let's start with the Earth's moon, which we call simply the moon, as a basis for comparison. The moon is a sphere with a diameter of 3,475 kilometers. It orbits Earth in the same direction that Earth rotates. Its orbital period, the time it takes to complete one trip around the Earth, is 27.3 days. Because this orbital period is longer than a day, the moon rises in the east and sets in the west, just like the sun. The phases of the moon are caused by the changing angle of the sunlight hitting the moon as it travels along its orbit. Thus, the moon presents a slightly different shape to us with each rise. Phobos. Phobos is tiny, being only 22.5 kilometers across. From the surface of Mars, Phobos appears about one-third the size of Earth's moon. It is not round at all, presenting a lumpy oblong shape, rather like a potato. <clears throat> Phobos orbits Mars in the same direction the planet rotates, but much more quickly than the planet turns. It moves so quickly that from the surface of Mars, Phobos rises in the west and sets in the east, taking just a little more than four hours to cross the sky. You could watch Phobos rise and set twice each day on Mars if you had nothing better to do. Another interesting effect of this fast orbit is that Phobos goes through several of its phases as it crosses the sky. Deimos. Deimos is even smaller than Phobos, being only 12.4 kilometers across. It is also farther away than Phobos. From the surface of Mars, Deimos appears only as a particularly bright star. Deimos orbits just a bit slower than the planet's rotation. This means that Deimos rises in the east and sets in the west. But, because its orbital period is so close to the planet's rotational period, Deimos takes 66 hours to cross the sky. While Deimos is up, the sun would pass it twice. You could go to bed and get up and Deimos would still be up, two nights in a row. Deimos goes through several of its phases as it crosses the sky, just like Phobos. However, you would only see this as changes in its brightness. Now, about that view. Imagine yourself standing on the surface of Mars, watching these moons. Phobos, a shape-shifting blob zipping across the sky backwards, and Deimos, a bright star of varying intensity, plodding along forwards, slower than the sun. Seems like a pretty cool view, don't you think? Oxygen. Despite the fact that the atmosphere of Mars is thin and harmful to humans, 
it turns out that oxygen will be pretty easy to come by. The primary component of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, or CO2. This is the same gas that we exhale. In small amounts, like when your little brother breathes on you, it's not harmful. But in the high concentration found on Mars, it is harmful to humans. There are a number of chemical processes we can use to separate the oxygen from the CO2, as well as to create other useful chemicals. We can also separate the water on Mars into oxygen and hydrogen through a process called electrolysis. Together, these chemical processes will enable colonists to create all the oxygen they need, plus a variety of useful chemicals and compounds, from fuel of various types to plastics for construction. Radiation. There are two types of radiation to worry about on Mars. Solar, which originates from the sun, and cosmic, which originates from outside the solar system. On Earth, we are protected from both types by the atmosphere and the magnetic field. On Mars, this is not the case. Solar radiation. This is radiation that originates from the sun. It includes electromagnetic radiation as well as high energy particles. Electromagnetic radiation, or EMR, includes the visible light we get from the sun. You probably know the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But did you know there are wavelengths beyond both ends of that list that we cannot see? Of particular concern are the wavelengths beyond violet, the ultraviolet. These are the wavelengths that cause us to get sunburns. The atmosphere of Mars shields against much of this EMR, though not as effectively as the atmosphere of Earth. Luckily, we can shield ourselves from EMR with proper clothing and visor material. Lower elevations also provide more protection, since there is more atmosphere above them. With suitable precautions, colonists on Mars will be able to move about on the surface without worry from solar electromagnetic radiation. In addition to electromagnetic radiation, the sun continually throws off high energy particles in all directions. The term we use for this continual spray of particles is solar wind. Sometimes the sun will eject a particularly large burst of these particles in one direction. We call these events solar flares or coronal mass ejections. These particles are prevented from reaching the surface of Earth by the Earth's magnetic field and thick atmosphere. On Mars, there is very little to stop them. Luckily, we can predict their arrival by monitoring the activity of the sun. During periods of high solar activity, future colonists will have to stay underground. Cosmic radiation. These are high energy particles that originate outside our solar system, often from stars that have exploded into supernova. Their occurrence is unpredictable and they are difficult to shield against. The thin atmosphere and weak magnetic field of Mars provide very little protection against these particles. Colonists will need to rely on thick layers of rock and soil to protect themselves. It also turns out that water in either liquid or solid form provides a good shield. Adults will be able to move about on the surface, though they will have to limit their exposure. Because their bodies are still developing, children are more susceptible to the effects of this radiation and will have to be protected in their early years. more permanent solutions. Many approaches to dealing with radiation on Mars have been proposed, and there is much ongoing research in this area. It is possible that future Martians will protect themselves with dietary supplements, or by editing their genes to make their bodies more resistant, 
or by creating artificial magnetic fields. Sky color. No human eye has seen the Martian sky. We have imagery from our landers and rovers on the surface, and a great deal of effort has gone into calibrating these cameras. But what a camera sees is not what a human perceives. The truth is that we cannot know what the Martian sky will look like to a human on the surface until one stands there and looks. We can, however, make an educated guess. The sun's radiation provides our light. The color of the sky depends on how that light is scattered and absorbed by molecules and particles in the atmosphere. If there were no atmosphere at all, the sky would appear black. On Earth, the molecules that compose our atmosphere scatter the blue wavelengths of solar radiation in a process called Rayleigh scattering. This is what gives us a blue sky. The Martian atmosphere, while much thinner than Earth's, still causes Rayleigh scattering. So you might expect the Martian sky to be blue, though perhaps much more dark than Earth's. However, Mars is a dry and dusty place. Even on clear days, there's a great deal of suspended dust in the atmosphere. This dust is primarily iron oxide, which absorbs blue light. The combined effect of this scattering and absorption is a sky expected to appear tannish yellow on most days. Because of the intensity of the light near the sun, Rayleigh scattering would dominate, creating a blue haze around the sun's disk. Soil. Recent data from the rovers we have on Mars indicate that much of the soil there contains perchlorates. These are chemicals that can be harmful to humans, especially children. Future colonists will have to be very careful how they manage soil and keep it from entering their habitations. The good news is that perchlorates are water soluble and easy to rinse off. Even more good news is that perchlorates can be processed to make oxygen and fuel. Suits. The surface suits on Mars will be very different than the extravehicular activity suits used by current astronauts, which are essentially tiny spaceships. The suits for surface activity on Mars will be lighter and more sleek. They will run with less pressure than current suits, allowing the suit to be more flexible and easier to move about in. In fact, it is possible that the suits themselves will not be pressurized at all. Instead, they will be skin-tight suits that use the mechanical pressure of the fabric to counter the low atmospheric pressure of Mars. The only part of such a suit that will be pressurized with air will be the helmet. This would allow great ease of movement for activity on the surface. Suits of this type are called mechanical counterpressure or MCP suits, and it is this sort of suit that the children in the story wear. The helmets the children wear are also equipped with a head-up display, or HUD, H-U-D, that projects readouts and video feeds directly on the visor screen. This allows the wearer to monitor life support data without looking down, as well as providing enhanced reality features like video overlays onto the wearer's field of view. Water. Access to water will be critical to the colonization of Mars. There is the obvious need of direct consumption by humans and food crops, but water will also be critical to the creation of fuels and plastics that will be required. These things require carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. While we can get carbon and oxygen from the Martian atmosphere, we will need to find another source of hydrogen. That source will be water, which is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. We now know that Mars was previously quite wet and that there is still a considerable amount of water on the planet. Because of the thin atmosphere, no liquid water can exist on the surface. It would immediately boil away, but there is ice 
primarily at the planet's poles. There are also strong indications that there is ice and water under the surface in many locations. Colonies on Mars will need to be located near such water sources. And that's the end of the science section. Thanks for listening.